Hi everybody, this is Arkady Frechtman. I'm a New York City personal injury trial attorney. And today we're gonna to be talking about a soft tissue verdict that just came down a few days ago in another state. And it was for over $2 million. How did they do it on a soft tissue injury? Well, let's get into it. Let's look at this case. It's a case actually handled by another trial lawyer in the state of Colorado. And I know this lawyer because a few years ago, I went to a retreat in Montana and it was like a type of trial lawyers college known as trial by human. And we worked together. He was there, he was practicing. And since that retreat, he's done about, I think four jury trials. And so this was one that just came down. So this was a disc herniation after a car crash. There were no injections done and there was no surgery recommendation. So not only was there no surgery, but there was no surgery recommendation. So let's get into it. How did he do this? Well, at first he starts off by saying that he just hired a new um, attorney and that attorney did a lot of the pre-litigation workup. And in fact, he was training that attorney as a trial attorney, which is very commendable. That he's training other attorneys to get better and to become trial attorneys. And that she filed 11 motions in limine. And these motions in limine were for punitive damages, compel, responses to the defense motions, motions for directed verdict, motions about causation, which is something that happens in, in a lot of trials. Now, the basics were about the client. The client was a gentleman. He was married. He had five children. He was a real fitness person. He was into sports. He was into lifting weights, running, and he had a physique that most people would die for, just an amazing great physique. He had body fat percentages in the teens, low teens. He had zero prior history of any injury. Um, and they went back 10 years and there was nothing, no, no medical care, no injuries. So that was a good thing for the plaintiff. And um, maybe he had just a handful of visits and no, none of them were even for an injury, just a handful of visits to a doctor, like a primary care physician, you know. So they interviewed his family and friends. They confirmed that they never heard of him complain of any injury. And he had two businesses that were making profits and he worked in both of them daily. And he was just a great guy, like a family man devoted to his faith. So he was driving the speed limit, 25 miles an hour on a city street. And the defendant who worked for an auto glass company pulled out of an alley without looking for traffic, and that's where the crash occurred. So then the defendant flees the scene in the company car, in the company van. The cops come, the defendant is found by calling the company that he works for, and he comes back to the scene. Both vehicles are repaired, no airbags deploy, and this all happened on a Saturday morning. So the client reports knee pain because he hits both knees on the dashboard at the time of impact. He was wearing a seatbelt and he has neck pain, dizziness, and he gets shook up. And then basically they sit, sit him down on the curb and he gets checked out by the ambulance. He gets cleared and he refuses to go to the emergency room because, you know, he knows a little bit about health and fitness. So the next day, Sunday, the client is having more pain now in his neck, his upper back, his lower back, his hips and glutes. He has headaches and he has pain radiating or traveling to both shoulders. And he is at this time a licensed massage therapist. So he understands this is not an emergency and does not go to the ER. But Monday, this happened on Saturday. So now Monday, he starts calling chiropractors and actually got in the same day. And the chiropractor he sees recommends a massage, uh, and a nurse practitioner. And so the nurse practitioner orders the MRIs because there's been no improvement for two weeks and he has these radicular symptoms, which means like, you know, radiculopathy from the neck, it'll travel to the hands, from the lower back, it'll travel down to the legs. And that's something you have to really watch out for. And uh, when he does the straight leg raising test, it's positive. He, that's when he has the radicular symptoms. So the MRI gets done and the MRI shows He's got a two to three centimeter bulging disc in his, uh, I believe, in his neck, okay? And then he's got no nerve impingement in the neck. But in the lower back, he has two bulging discs at L3, L4. Um, and then these do not impact the nerves. And at L5, 
S1, he has a five to six millimeter disc herniation with an annular tear and a possible small extrusion, which means that's a herniation, right? There's an extrusion from the disc. Part of the disc is leaking out, touching the nerve roots. But the reading radiologist would not even say that it was an extrusion because it wasn't clear on the films. And so the client treats for 12 weeks without any improvement and is sent to pain management. Pain management offers him injections, but he refuses injections because he's afraid of needles and the risks associated with spine procedures. He just doesn't want to get involved with that stuff. So the client gets a shoulder MRI four weeks later, just because his shoulders feel weak and his left shoulder feels like it's starting to pop. And the MRIs reveal some tearing. And again, steroid injections are recommended, but again, the client refuses to do anything. So the client really believes in holistic healing. He doesn't want any drugs. He doesn't want any invasive procedures. He complies with the, the plan and he does strength training, mostly bands, not weights. He does trigger point, massage work on himself. His symptoms start to improve, but the neck, shoulders, and low back just don't get any better. So he treats for 10 months, then stops treatment because he has plateaued and is about 80% recovered. One of the chiropractors tells him at this point, 80% is as good as it's ever going to get. And that's known as maximum medical improvement. A lot of people go through that. So um, another chiropractor says that even if the herniated disc heals, it's going to scar and the pain and discomfort will likely continue. So his medical bills at this point are 37,000 and they're all on a lien or letter of protection, which means the doctors are treating him, you know, free of charge. He's not paying for this, but they're adding up their bills and then they're going to have a lien. So when he wins money at the end of the case, if he wins money, they're going to take that back, that 37,000. So there's never any surgical recommendation and the client does not get any injections. So at this point, he has to shut down his business, which is a massage business, because he simply cannot complete a massage session without pain. He continues in his other business, which does not require physical exertion, and that business starts making more profit. So the plaintiff's attorney sends out the settlement opportunity letter. He did it the way I have recommended here in past videos. He sends out a settlement opportunity letter for the full policy limits, for, uh, which were $1 million. And the plaintiff's attorney gives them everything. He says, here, here's the MRI images. Here's everything. So the insurance company comes back with an offer of $29,500. And they want five years prior tax returns to evaluate this loss of business claim, right? Because his massage um, business shut down. And after some discussion, the plaintiff's attorney gets everything, turns it over to the insurance company, and again says, okay, let's settle for the $1 million. And now the insurance company offers $31,500. So <laughs> it's crazy. Like they offered $29,000. And then they went up to thirty, thirty-one. dollars so They went up $2,000, you know? So obviously you see what they're doing. They're just negotiating in bad faith because the plaintiff's attorney is saying, look, I'm going to take a million. Here's all the evidence to support the million. And they're offering like, you know, 30, you know, 29, then 31. They're, they're stuck down way, way, way below. They're not moving. And so the insurance company responds and says that the closure of this business is not because of the injuries, but it's because of COVID and he would have lost the business anyway. So that's, you know, typical insurance response. So now the plaintiff's attorney wants to make sure that the client does not change his mind about injections and that his pain does not get any worse. So with the client's consent, they take a wait and see approach. The pain does not get any better. He starts experiencing depression which he never treats for because he lost a lot of muscle mass and he got like skinny fat because he was like, you know, like I said, he was a big guy, you know, big guy. He would lift weights. He was strong, but now he lost a lot of muscle mass. So to him, this meant that his upper body muscle dropped and he got a beer gut for the first time in his life. He was not sleeping well due to his neck, shoulder and back pain. It had been about 18 months since the crash at this point. Then all of a sudden his wife left him and took the minor children because he was, quote, not the same man she married. So this was two years after the crash. The decision was made to file a lawsuit and the client agreed. So the theme was that the client, quote, was no longer the same person who was in the crash. So he wasn't the same person, right? Before he was lean, he had uh, very little uh, body fat, he was muscular, he was lifting weights, he had a family, you know, five kids, uh, a wife, now his life is completely turned upside down. The wife leaves, the minor children are gone. He's by himself, he's fat, he, he loses his muscle. 
So they file a lawsuit. Now the lawsuit proceeds as expected. They hired an expert to do an evaluation of the client's business losses. And the expert said after an analysis that the losses were 459,000. Um, now this is if the client were to work until age 60, which was the client's own chosen retirement age. And that's a typical retirement age. Usually people work to 60, 65. Now, um, he was an excellent expert. He was great on cross. And um, when they got to the numbers, he could explain it well to the jury. And there were no other experts retained about this issue. So the client returns to treatment with the same providers after a two year gap. So for two years, he doesn't get any treatment. Then he returns uh, after a two year gap. And he returns not because the lawyer filed a lawsuit, but because you know he, he had pain. His back and neck are just not getting any better and he's frustrated with how his life is going. So he's again offered injections for the lumbar herniation and he still refuses. He attends four of six recommended appointments with a chiropractor and then he just stops. Still no surgical recommendation or even an orthopedic referral. So now the case is in a lawsuit and they try to do a mediation. And at the mediation, they reiterate all the losses. They, at this point, they're saying, look, we, we gave you a chance to settle it for a million. That train has left the station. Now we're asking for two million. And, you know, and they offer that. Now the best offer from the insurance company at this point is a hundred thousand. And so the client agreed that was not enough and just walked and no other offer was made. And it was the lawyer's opinion that the policy was open because they clearly laid out the non-economic damages, the pain and suffering, the impairment, the loss of enjoyment of life, the impairment being the herniated disc and the business losses. So taking all that together, that's worth more than a million and all they have is a million, right? So now the policy is open and if they hit for more than a million, the insurance company is gonna to have to pay whatever the verdict will be. But the insurance company just did not care and was stuck on the fact that the medical bills were only 37,000. You see, they, they evaluated it wrong, the wrong way. You don't wanna look at the medical bills, but the plaintiff's attorney was smart. He waived the medical bills, meaning he's not even gonna pursue the medical bills. Now, this is very smart because if you do try to pursue the medical bills, they become a low anchor. And then the jury is gonna say, well, your medical bills are 37,000. How about I give you triple that? Well, triple 30 is like, what, 90? You don't want that, right? You want millions. So he waived them, that's brilliant. Now. He also sent a final settlement opportunity letter for 1.5 million. And he again outlined why they needed to pay and that at trial, if he was before a jury at trial, that they would ask for at least 2.5 million. And the insurance company just ignored it. They didn't even respond. So now the trial was set for five days and they actually cut it down. They did like a speed trial. They cut everything down to three days. They sent a case to the jury on a Wednesday at 2 p.m. And the defense got a failure to mitigate jury instruction, which just basically means that, you know, the plaintiff could have had injections, he could have had surgery, and that would have mitigated or reduced his damages, but he didn't, he chose not to do that. So then that could be the plaintiff's own fault. And so the lawyer goes into a little bit about how the trial went. Now, first was jury selection, and he basically, you know, said, look, I want to express this theme of brutal honesty. Let's be honest. Tell, talk to me. Tell me how you really feel about the issues in this case. Don't sugarcoat it. You know, tell me, um, you know, even if I don't want to hear it, tell, tell it to me like it is. And so the jurors agreed to be brutally honest. And he used the hypothetical about Bill Gates. He said, what if Bill Gates was in a museum and Bill Gates accidentally broke a, a vase? And then he had the jury talk about that, talk about it with him, but also talk about it with each other. And that's really good because it forms a group. The jurors start looking at each other. They start discussing things, you know, as a group. And basically the idea that came out of that discussion was that it doesn't matter who breaks the vase, right? Whether it's Bill Gates or whether it's like a homeless guy who breaks the vase, it doesn't matter. What matters is the value that's taken. And in this case, the value that's taken is a person's health. So, so basically, yeah, that's what he says. And then uh, basically he goes on to a few other things, judging the credibility of people. Uh, and some people, witnesses, are going to have massive education, right? Maybe they went to Harvard. But if they went to Harvard and they tell you, hey, smoking cigarettes is good for you, would you believe them? No, right? And then he, so he goes into that. So that's kind of like priming them, priming the jurors to get ready for, um, the defense, right? Because the defense is going to have hired guns. 
And then he used some questions about accountability, ownership, responsibility to try to identify defense-minded jurors. And he says that seemed to work well. I don't know exactly what he means by this. Uh, uh, maybe I'll ask him, uh, you know, uh, just to follow up because I'm curious what he means by this because it's kind of a general sentence. And then he says that um, he used uh, this thing where you ask the jurors, what are your most important values? Like, what are the values that your parents taught you? Or what are the values that you would teach to your children? And he learned that from another attorney. And he says, that's a very powerful thing to do. Uh, and that, that really works well. So, um, so the jury selection went well. He said it was like the best jury they ever got. In opening statement, you know, he recounted again how the trial went, but he told the jury about this defense medical examiner, which, you know, the defense case, the whole case is based on this defense medical examiner. That's the only expert they have. And he said, look, this expert is going to say that four to six weeks uh, was the treatment, right, that he had, four to six weeks. There was no impairment and there was no permanency. And look, look at how often this expert testifies for the defense and how much he already made in, in this case. But also, he set it up in the deposition when he took the deposition of this defense medical expert. In the deposition, he said he's a professional witness and he referred to him in the opening statement as a professional witness hired by the defense throughout opening and throughout trial. So he kind of like, he said, that's who he is. Um, and he almost, he teased the jury by telling them that they would learn just how much this expert makes a year doing these defense medical exams, right? He didn't tell them, he couldn't tell them how much because the judge said that's not allowed in opening statement. And the expert actually even had a personal lawyer and the personal lawyer convinced the judge to issue like a protective order. But he said, look, you'll find out during the trial. And so he actually filed a motion to compel disclosure of the last five years of this defense medical expert's income and his last 10 defense medical examination reports. So that's brilliant. That's really smart to do to show, hey, this is a business. You're always saying nobody's ever heard. You're always testifying for this insurance company or this defense lawyer. So come on, uh, you're not an impartial expert. And so when this expert walked in, right, before he even testified, he just walks in the door and, you know, the, the judge says, call your next witness. Okay, we call Dr. S, you know. So when this expert just walks in, um, the jury scowled. So already the jury was like upset with this guy before he even testified. So it's a brilliant move by the lawyer to set it up like that in opening statement and uh, in, in voir dire. And so on cross-examination, this defense expert just basically said he came off as very arrogant, condescending, and he said that the injuries and the pain after six weeks, so six weeks after the crash happened, the injuries and the pain are no longer related and are just a coincidence. So that's like a cross-examination point that you could make, right? Because the expert will say, well, yeah, after the crash happened, the person had some pain. Well, that's why they went to the hospital. That's why they went to doctors. That's why they got treatment. But then six weeks later, you know, it's all sprain and strain, right? Contusion. So everything went away. So that's what the, the guy said. So you're telling us this is just all a big coincidence that he went to bed, let's say six weeks after the crash happened, he went to bed and he had these injuries like herniations and permanent injuries. But when he woke up that morning after six weeks, he was just completely fine and that it's all just a big coincidence. It had nothing to do with the crash. It's just a big coincidence that he happened to have this herniation. But six weeks later, after the car accident, he just woke up and everything was gone, right? There was nothing permanent. And so he got really waffled, this defense expert, and he tried to get out of it. But finally, he got so angry that he said, yes, that is what I'm saying. And so it's just an impossible, implausible, ridiculous position, right? And then closing argument, um, the lawyer asked for 3.5 million and he told the jury that a herniated disc is not the same as when the client was born because it's an impairment so to his physical body and all the damages related to that disc should go there under a category of compensation, right? Because the herniated disc wasn't the same as when he was born. It wasn't even the same as how he was when he was working out, right? Before the crash, this all happened because of the crash. So they have to compensate him for this impairment to his uh, body. And so, um, and the defense closing was basically that not a single medical provider said that any of this was permanent, that there's no physical impairment losses, 
there was only 30,000 for four to six weeks of pain. Uh, they had, no, they said 30,000 was reasonable for four to six weeks of pain. Because remember, the defense is basically saying that the pain only lasts for four to six weeks, right? Because it's not permanent. So it was, it was there for four to six weeks and then it just went away. Like one day he just woke up and it was just magically poof and it was gone. So that, that's what he crossed the defense expert on. And that, that's why it's just like, are you telling me this is just all a coincidence that the car accident had nothing to do with, with any of these permanent injuries? And so they said 30,000 was a fair verdict and they relied heavily on their defense expert's testimony. And they again reminded the jury that they, the defense, did not have to prove anything and that the plaintiff had the burden of proof. And in the rebuttal closing, um, the plaintiff just said, look, um, I reminded the jury about the doctors who testified and that the herniated disc is permanent. And I asked them to bring back a verdict that says when you break or damage something, you have to pay the full value for it. And his last sentence was that anything less than full justice is no justice. And the jury deliberated for about two hours, two and a half hours, and they came back and they basically, um, uh, the judge started reading the verdict. And when he read the amount for non-economic damages, now this is pain and suffering, the judge starts off as 5,072. And then the lawyer says, my heart sunk. And I was like, oh my God, how are they only giving 5,000? What did I do wrong? But then the judge corrected himself and he said, I mean, 572,220. And then he almost fell out of his chair and his client started to cry in the courtroom. And then for economics, it was $459,339. The exact amount their expert, the business loss expert, said that their client lost from the massage business being shut down. Now he had to hold back tears. Now the lawyer's starting to cry. And then the physical impairment was $1,156,320. So uh, the total verdict was $2,187,879 on a $100,000 offer and a $1 million policy with interest and four years since the crash, the interest will be about another $800,000. So the total will be 3 million. And now he's working with other lawyers to make sure he gets the 3 million and to do everything correctly to get the full value. So I hope this was helpful. Let us know what questions you have. We are here for you. Our goal is helping serious injury victims and families. If you need a consultation, just text me, 347-566-9595. And uh, please like and subscribe to our channel. Let us know what questions you have. But it could be done. Look, a soft tissue case, no surgery, no injections, no recommendation for surgery, right? The doctor didn't even say that you, he needs surgery, but they got it. And the way that they got it is the guy goes to the client's house. He gets to know the client. He breaks bread with the client. He gets to know the client's story and he tells it in a, from an authentic, powerful, um, you know, position. And that's how they get these big, big multi-million dollar verdicts. Okay. Have a great day, everyone.